Good morning. I want to spend a few minutes talking about the state of tooling in our big data world. And actually, I like the place where Doug finished, because that's a great place for me to start. Um, I want to talk about the tooling from a platform perspective, but in a different way than many, many people in the room think of a platform. I want to talk about it in the terms of data as a platform. And that may sound pretty strange and abstract, but if you think, if we define the platform as a place where people come together and producers and consumers come together for mutual benefit, it's pretty easy to see how data can be at the center of that. Um, and when Doug ended by saying, do you have others, do your friends have data that you can make use of as well? That's kind of where I want to start. And, uh, you know, as Ed said, maybe a latecomer or whatnot. By the next nine minutes, um, I want to be able to explain this, because when we announced our support for Hadoop back in September, uh, a lot of interesting reactions in the industry and in the community, a lot of interesting reactions within Microsoft, because we have our own big data technology we've developed, which has hundreds of petabytes of data, or tens of thousands of jobs a day that run a lot of our online businesses. And people were looking at it in terms of a technology standpoint, but if we look at it in terms of data as a platform, um, the fact that there's just so much data in Hadoop, it makes a lot of sense for us to participate there. And I want to build a frame and then talk about tooling investment uh, on top of that. So many people in this room uh, are refining data daily, going from signal to data to information to knowledge. Ultimately, it's all about getting to insights and actions. And if we look at how this has played out over the last several decades, again, something that Doug touched on, uh, we used to pay armies of people to key punch observable states into digital data so that we could process it. For the last several decades, we've built information models, and we knew the questions that those would support up front, and then we coaxed data into data warehouses through ETL processes. And what we're really trying to do here is reduce the time to insight, the time from some observation to the point that we can create value out of it. So many of us are doing this refinement, but if we think of it in terms of just being in the raw ore, we like strip mining and then trying to pull stuff out of it. What if we could stand on the work of others? What if instead we could go out and buy ingots of base metals and combine them to produce the alloys we want? It's very hard today. And so we'll think about that in terms of the tools. The other dimension that I want to set on this frame is this notion of combining data. And it's not strictly orthogonal, but this notion of my data, my organization's data, my community's data, and then the world data. And this is contextual. So what my data, the organizational data, community data might mean for a CFO in a commercial corporation is quite different than what it might mean for, uh, let's say, an executive director of a nonprofit. And being able to take the friction out of this and pull it together will unleash a ton of value. So for those of you in the US, here's a little thought experiment that might bring this home. Think about how many times over the last year you've either been asked or typed into a web form the following triple. Zip code, city, and state. Now, as a data geek, that's kind of a head scratcher because there's a, a common authority. The data is really clean. It's public data. Why, and the fact that the zip code is a map to a city and state, why are we doing this all the time? And I think it speaks to this fact that we're not able to take friction out and combine data in this form. So if we put these two things together and be able to stand on it, we think about both being able to refine and combine and lift things up such that we're not always going down to the bottom. What we can do is define a plane here and think about our tooling at that point. And when we do that, a different set of verbs emerge. How do we discover the data that might be useful to us? How do we publish it so others can consume it? How do we integrate the social aspect? Other people like me, what types of data are they looking at? What feeds, what services? And if we do that and bring the tooling up to that level, the distance between where we start and where we really want to get to in terms of insights and actions can be reduced. And ultimately, the, the trick is to reduce the time to insight. So this is the frame we want to work with. Now, again, all about insights. That's where we want to get to. And there are two cuts through this, two little arcs I want to take. One that's mostly around refine, and another one that's mostly about combine. And then we'll put it all together. So one of the aspects of this notion of more data is better. The folks at Google published an interesting paper, Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data. And the idea here is that you can look at it one of two ways. Having more data that is less clean is better than having a pristine, smaller corpus in, in many ways. And also, the notion of having uh, you know, more data and less sophisticated algorithms 
So some folks at Microsoft Research published a paper with some, a, a really catchy title. And um, the idea here was that it, for this classification, feeding more data to less sophisticated algorithms beat the sophisticated algorithms you know, over and over again in, in some of the studies they've done. So you can read these papers um, and sort of get a sense for this. But there's a story that really brings this home. And it begins with the events of January 12, 2010 when the magnitude 7 earthquake hit Haiti. Immediately, relief pour, poured in from around the world. And the relief workers ran into an incredible problem. Most of the people in Haiti spoke only their native tongue, Haitian Creole. Of course, most of the relief workers didn't. And this caused a tremendous amount of friction in getting to aid to where it needed to get to. A week after the earthquake, someone sent an email to a colleague and said, hey, is there anything we can do in terms of machine translation to be able to translate for one or another? This paper chronicles the building of a working Haitian Creole to English, English to Haitian Creole translator that was used in the relief efforts in less than five days. Now, the trick here, which goes back to this notion of more data is better, is that it used statistical machine learning um, it would be impossible to do it in this time for this domain uh, with the linguistic approach. And they were able to hone in on the dialogue of relief, including the abbreviations that people were using in SMS text messages and asking for help and such. So it really does speak to the power of having the right form of data and having the tools to go off and do it. Now, when I speak to customers, you know, there is this thing, how do we get the data scientists, how do we get the big data? But in terms of lifting things up, the thing we have to say is, how do we just make ourselves available to the, the result of that? So here, in this case, a service that you can just access that will do the translation for you once it's been built. So that's interesting. But in this new world, these new tools, I believe we'll have marketplaces of content, data and information, but also of services and models. And so we'll see these marketplaces build out, and again, it's part of the ecosystem. So, this whole notion about refining more data is better getting access to it. The other cut I want to take through this is data finding data. Now, in our work, what we did is we looked at people, like many in this room, in the tools that they used. Some folks used R, SAS, a lot of Homebrew, a lot of Python, SciPy, uh, folks using Excel, various aspects. And I refer to these as last mile tools. And what we found when we started looking at how people were using, we found two things. One, a lot of these people shared the results of their work. But if they did it in the last mile tool, they could only share it with those folks who had the same setup and kit. So you're mailing our workspaces around Excel files and whatnot. And the other thing that was interesting is that um, there's a lot of people who are just building intermediate products, and they're embedded in the solution. So in my own stuff I've done in the last few months, I had an occasion I needed to figure out how to map two-character ISO country codes to three-character, uh, lat-long centroid for every you know, zip code, and things of that nature. And if you do this sort of thing, you realize you've got these things around, you've done them before, and you, you kind of pull them out. But what, imagine if there was a tool, a way for us to build these intermediate products and publish them as a data endpoint. So we have work, been working on this tool we call the Data Explorer, which is meant to do just that. And behind the UI, there's a pretty sophisticated functional data flow language and a runtime behind it. And the idea is you can author these things and then publish them for sharing locally, for publishing them to share others in your work group. And if you think about open data uh, initiatives in government, being able to author them and then publish them for public consumption. So that was pretty cool. We're learning a lot with that. And then what we did over the last few months is we added a recommendation engine to it. So based upon the data that you're working with and the model you're working with, we'll make recommendations on other data sets and other content available in the data market that might be useful. For you. Now, the font here is really small. It's not meant to really be read. But for those of you in the back, one of the things that's recommended here, and there are things associated with addresses. And the zip code uh, data from the post office is recommended here. So hopefully, we can not have to type all that stuff in in the future. Um, but this notion of data finding data, really taking the friction out of uh, pulling these things together. Final thing, and again, Doug touched on this in, uh, in the intro, they touched on this, this notion of visualization and insights. And for the people here, if you abstract the workflow that many of us do, it's about searching and acquiring, getting the right data, 
It's about exploring and then analyzing, and then subsequently explaining. So there's this notion of exploratory versus explanatory work. I think it's really important, just say for visualization. There are a set of visualizations which are very good for the exploratory sense, and a set which are very good for the explanatory sense. And for those of you who've gone in and played with processing and played with, you, know, you fire up the IDE and you start writing code. What if we had tooling such that if you knew PowerPoint or Keynote, you could build many of those uh, visualizations in a way that lets the people who have the context get their fingers into things and explore? So that's really what we want to go do. And we want to do it across a spectrum that runs from petabytes to terabytes, gigabytes, all the way down and get it out to the end user. So this pattern in terms of search, acquire, explore, analyze, explain, and share can play out once over this entire continuum or can play out multiple times. And um, so one of the things that we have that we've been working on is this tool is PowerView, which is going to ship with SQL Server 2012. Very easy for people to go off and do it and then allow end users to, to interact. So here we can highlight and interact um, and get a pop-up additional information. Uh, brush and be able to filter just through visual gestures, and then uh, over timelines be able to have animations that can describe how things. And the idea is to make this really, really easy. So if you know how to do PowerPoint, you know how to go build these and then uh, uh, author them and distribute them. So to close it all down, you know, the point here is really about defining a new agenda for the tooling uh, that lifts things up to reduce the distance between insights and actions. And when seen this way, it's not a question of is it Microsoft or Oracle or EMC. Or, it really has to be uh, the ability for the community to come together and participate in this ecosystem. So these are just some of the folks that we've been working with over the last year who are present at Strata. Um, and it's really been uh, quite different for the folks in the, my division to go off and do some of the things we've done over the last year. Uh, one example is we've developed a JavaScript framework uh, to allow you to author MapReduce jobs in JavaScript, and there's a talk on that later on in the day. Uh, some of the stuff you'll see in the booths if you want to run down there. Um, guys will show you the, some of the things that I've shown right here. So hopefully, 10 minutes later, um, it explains our approach here and why we made the announcement we did relative to Hadoop in September. Even if Ed wants to call us a, a newcomer, I think it was, or a, a late bloomer. Um, and so there it is. So that's the, the new agenda for tools. I really think we can make a ton, a huge difference as an industry, as a community, if we can up level this such that we don't have to go all the way down uh, and start working from sort of the raw dirt. So thank you for your time.